The Shirangama Sutra, Fascicle 9 of 10. Chapter 7 The Six Planes of Existence Caused by Unenlightenment. The Realm of the Gods, or Devloka. The Four Regions of the Dhyana Heavens of the Realm of Form, or Rupadhatu. The First Region of the Three Dhyana Heavens. 1. Ananda. All worldly men who do not practice dhyana in their cultivation of the mind cannot achieve wisdom. If they only abstain from sexual desires, of which they do not even think in their daily activities, they will not be contaminated by love and will leave the realm of desires. They will be reborn as they wish as people, or Brahmaparishadya, in the heaven called Brahmakaika. Two, those who relinquish their habits of desire and so realize minds free from lust are able to keep the rules of morality and discipline and to live purely whatever they do. They will be reborn as ministers of Brahma in the heaven called Brahma Purohita. 3. Those whose bodies and minds are profound and perfect, whose deportment and pure living are irreproachable, and who thereby achieve clear understanding are qualified to rule over the Brahmadevas as their lords or Mahabrahma Devaraja. This is the Mahabrahma heaven. Ananda. These three heavens are free from all worldly troubles which cannot reach them. Although these gods do not practice the right samadhi, their minds are still and free from all disturbances. This is the first region of the Dhyana heavens the second region of the three Dhyana heavens. 1. Ananda. Next comes the heaven of Brahma, who reigns over his people and perfects the rules of pure living, and whose unperturbed mind is still and shining. This is the heaven of minor light, or Paritabha. 2. The above light grows brighter and illumines all the worlds in the ten directions, thereby changing everything into clear crystal. This is the heaven of infinite light, or Apramarnabha. 3. The preservation of this infinite light now becomes the theme of the teaching voice that preaches purity and cleanness to all who can respond. This is the Abhasvara heaven. Ananda. These three heavens are beyond all worldly troubles, and, although their devas do not practice the right samadhi, their pure and clean minds are free from all the coarse characteristics of sansara. This is the second region of the dhyana heavens. The third region of the three dhyana heavens. 1. Ananda. Thus, these devas transmute this perfect light into the theme of the voice, which reveals the wonderful state and thereby gives rise to pure conduct that unites with dhyana by wiping out all former feelings of joy. This is the heaven of minor purity, or Parita Shubha. 2. Pure voidness now manifests in its boundless immensity, causing both body and mind to experience comfortable weightlessness and nirvanic bliss. This is the heaven of infinite purity, or Aparamarshubha. 3. Body, mind, and universe are now in the state of perfect purity, which reveals clearly a supermundane abode full of nirvanic bliss. This is the heaven of universal purity, or Shubhakritsna. Ananda. These three heavens accord with the state of perfect dhyana, in which body and mind are at rest and enjoy boundless bliss. Although their devas have not achieved the right samadhi, their still minds are full of happiness. This is the third region of the dhyana heavens. The fourth region of the four dhyana heavens. 1. Further, Ananda, these devas whose bodies and minds are beyond all sufferings, the causes of which have been completely wiped out, realize that bliss is not permanent and will, in time, inevitably come to an end. They, therefore, relinquish completely the dual concept of suffering and happiness, and, as they wipe out the coarse characteristics of both conditions, the state of felicity manifests in all its purity. This is the heaven of 
felicitous birth, or punya prasava. Two, the elimination of the above duality results in their complete liberation from this hindrance and enables them to enjoy the full measure of felicity as long as they stay in this heaven. This is the heaven of felicitous delight, or cloudless felicity, or anabraka. 3. Ananda, the above heaven, now divides into two paths, one of which is attainable by those who, in the light of boundless purity, achieve the perfection of felicity as their abode. This is the heaven of abundant fruit, or Brihatvala. 4. On the other hand, if they wipe out both suffering and happiness, thereby developing a renouncing mind, which in time ensures their complete renunciation, both their bodies and minds will be eliminated, and with them all mental troubles. But because their practice is based on the sansaric idea of birth and death as a point of departure, they will not, for five hundred eons, realize their permanent nature. The reason is that in every Kalpa they can only succeed during its first half in wiping out all their thoughts, which, however, will recur during its second half because of the wrong starting point. This is the heaven of thoughtless devas, or Asanjasattva. Ananda, these four heavens are beyond all worldly suffering and happiness which can no more stir them. But they have not yet reached the true state of transcendental or wu wei immutability because they still preserve the notion of achievement. For this efficient achievement, they are called the fourth region of the dhyana heavens, the five heavens from which there is no return. Further, Ananda, above the fourth region of the dhyana heavens, there are five heavens from which there is no return whose devas have completely cut off all habits contracted through the nine types of delusion of each of the lower heavens. They are thus beyond suffering and happiness, and dwell no more in these inferior heavens. Hence, their present abodes set up by their achievement of renunciation. They are 1. Ananda with the complete elimination of both suffering and happiness, the struggling mind ceases to arise in this heaven, which is free from trouble and is called avriha. 2. There remains now the solitary renouncing mind that no longer confronts objects in this heaven, which is free from the heat of minor trouble, and is called atapa. 3. All the worlds in the ten directions are now clearly perceived as perfectly still, without even a speck of impurity, in this heaven of excellent perception, called Sudarshana. 4. The essence of seeing now manifests and dissolves all subtle hindrances in this heaven of excellent manifestations, called Sudrisha. 5. The utmost subtlety of form leads to its extreme limit, where starts boundless space in this ultimate heaven of finest form, called Akanishta. Ananda, these five heavens, from which there is no return, are imperceptible to the Deva kings of the four Dhyana heavens, who only hear of their existence, but cannot see them. They are like those holy sites, or Bodhimandalas, situated deep in the mountains, which are the abodes of our hearts, and which no worldling can see. Ananda, the above are the eighteen heavens of form, whose devas are solitaries beyond all desires, but are still hindered by their forms. These heavens are, therefore, in the realm of form. The four heavens of the formless realm of pure spirit, or Arupyadhatu, the state of the great Arhat. Further, Ananda, the region above the top of the realm of form is divided into two paths. If the renouncing minds of these devas create transcendental wisdom, the light of which is perfectly penetrating, they will leap over sansara to become arhats later to enter the bodhisattva state. They are called great arhats whose minds are turned towards Mahayana. The Four Heavens Beyond Form 1. On the other hand, if, after acquiring a renouncing mind, they relinquish this achievement and feel that their bodies are no longer obstructive, they will remove all obstacles to enter the void. This is the heaven of boundless emptiness, or Akashanantyayatana. 2. 
If, after wiping out all obstruction, they keep away from boundless voidness, they will retain only the subtle half of Glishta Manovigyana in the Alaya. This is the heaven of boundless consciousness, or Vigyana Nantyayatana. 3. With the elimination of both form and voidness, and the additional eradication of consciousness, all the ten directions will be completely still, merging into nothingness. This heaven is called Akinchanyayatana. 4. Consciousness now becomes immovable awareness, thus ending all further exhaustive search. As a result, the inexhaustible reveals the exhaustible, which seems to, yet does not, stay, and which seems to, yet does not, end. This is the heaven of devas who are neither thoughtful nor thoughtless, or Neva Sanjana Sanjayatana. The Anagaman Stage Though the devas of the four heavens beyond form succeed in looking exhaustively into the void, they fail to realize the absolute voidness of immaterial noumenon. They all come from the five heavens of form, from which there is no return, and if they do not stray from the holy way, they are called anagamans of arhatship, whose dull minds are not turned towards Mahayana. However, if they follow thoughtless devas of the heterodox way, and stay in this inexhaustible voidness, they will delight in sansaric heavens and will be deprived of the chance of hearing the Dharma. They will finally be turned back to the wheel of births and deaths. Ananda, all the devas in these heavens were once worldly men whose reward caused their rebirth there and after enjoying its fruit, they will have to return to sansara. However, their rulers or devaraja are bodhisattvas, who, in their practice of samadhi, appear in these heavens which they use as paths for their progressive advance towards Buddhahood. Ananda, the devas in these four heavens beyond form have wiped out all traces of body and mind. As their still dhyana nature has appeared, they are free from all retribution involving material forms. Hence, this is the region beyond form. All this comes from their being not clear about the profound mind of Bodhi, and because of their preservation of accumulated thoughts, they create the three illusory realms of existence through the seven states. Hence, they are living beings, or Pudgala, in the worlds they have deserved. The four classes in the realm of Titans, or Asuragati. Further, Ananda, there are four classes of Asuras in the three realms of existence. One, if a hungry ghost, while in his realm, strives to protect the Dharma, and thereby uses his powerful understanding to enter the void, he will be reborn from an egg as an Asura, who is connected with the realm of hungry ghosts. Two, if a Deva, because of his diminishing merits, is about to fall into the region near the sun and the moon, he will be reborn from a womb as an Asura, who is connected with the realm of human beings. Three, a king of the Asuras, who rules over the ghosts and spirits in the world, is powerful and fearless, and can fight for power against Brahma and his people, Shakra and the four kings of the four lower heavens. This Asura is born by transformation, and is connected with the realm of heavens. 4. Ananda There is another inferior class of Asuras, who are born in the sea, on the bed of which they live in holes. They roam in space during the day and return to the sea at night. These asuras are born from humidity and are connected with the realm of animals, birds, etc. Ananda, the above seven realms of hells, hungry ghosts, animals, birds, etc., men, seers, heavens, and titans come from their own illusions of worldly forms. They are created by their wrong thinking and are like flowers in the sky within their profound, perfect, bright, and non-creating fundamental minds. Essentially, they are not in bondage to anything and are the product of falsehood which has neither root nor clue. Ananda, these living beings are unaware of their fundamental minds and so suffer from this round of births and deaths in sansara. If they have passed countless eons without realizing the true and pure mind, 
It is because they have killed, stolen, and been carnal, the ceasing of which has caused them to be reborn where these acts are unknown. Where these acts exist is called the realm of hungry ghosts, and where they do not is called the realm of devas. The presence or absence of these three evils alternate and cause the wheel of sansara to turn. If they achieve samadhi, they will realize the profound, eternal, and still state, which is free from the duality of existence and non-existence, and is also beyond this very freedom from duality. In such a state, where even non-killing, non-stealing, and non-carnalizing cannot be found, how can there be such evils as killing, stealing, and carnality? Ananda, if an individual does not abstain from these three evil deeds, he will suffer from evil consequences. If a group of individuals commit them, they will all endure the same suffering in the same place, which cannot be said to be non-existent. However, this place arises from falsehood, which has no cause and cannot be sought anywhere. As you strive to realize Bodhi, you should wipe out these three evils. If you do not, whatever supernatural power you may acquire from your practice still pertains to worldly achievement. If your vicious habits are not cut off, you will fall into the realm of demons. And even if you then want to wipe out falsehood, you will only increase it. Therefore, the Tathagata says that you are most pitiable because your sufferings are self-inflicted and do not come from any defect of Bodhi. The above preaching is right, and any other is that of the demon Mara. Chapter 8 Warning to Practicers The Fifty False States Caused by the Five Aggregates States of Mara Caused by the Five Aggregates as the gathering drew to a close, the Buddha grasped the teapoy and made a move to rise from his lion seat, when suddenly he changed his mind, leaned back, and said to Ananda and the assembly, You Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas need to study more in your quest of supreme Bodhi. I have taught you the method of correct cultivation, but you still do not know the subtle states of Mara which appear when you practice Shamatha Vipassana. When they manifest, if you fail to distinguish them, and if your minds are not in a right state, you will fall into the evil ways of either the demons or your five aggregates, of the heavenly Maras, of ghosts and spirits, or of mischievous sprites. If you are not clear about them, you will mistake thieves for your own sons. Further, you may regard some little progress as complete achievement, like the untutored, Bhikshu, who when he reached the fourth dhyana heaven presumed that he had become a saint. After he had enjoyed his reward in heaven, all indications of his approaching fall appeared as he vilified the arhats. He created the karma of future incarnation and then fell into the avici hell. You should listen carefully to what I now tell you in detail. Ananda rose from his seat, and with all those requiring further study, prostrated himself at the Buddha's feet and awaited his compassionate instruction. The Buddha said, You should all know that the clear substance of the profound and bright basic Bodhi of all living beings of the twelve types of birth in sansara is that of all Buddhas in the ten directions. It is because you think wrongly that you are not clear about the noumenon, and so become stupid and full of desires which lead to your complete delusion. Hence the relative voidness, and as you are always deluded, the world is falsely created. All countries countless as dust are in sansara because of your obstinate wrong thinking. But you should know that relative voidness is created in your minds, like a small cloud that is but a speck in the great emptiness. How much more so is the world which is within this relative voidness? If you realize the real to return to the source, the void in the ten directions will vanish. Why then will not all the countries in that voidness shake and crack? When you practice dhyana to preserve the state of samadhi, all bodhisattvas and all great arhats whose essence of mind is already penetrative are unmoved 
but the kings of the demons, ghosts, spirits, and lower heavens are shocked to see their palaces break open without cause, and the great earth shake and crack. All those on earth and in the air take fright, whereas worldly men who are deluded do not feel anything, because these demons, though they have acquired five supernatural powers, still fail to realize transcendental insight into the ending of the stream of transmigration, for they have not broken their links with Sansara. How can they let you destroy their dwellings? This is why they come to trouble and annoy you when you enter the state of Samadhi. However, in spite of their rage, these demons are there in your profound state of Bodhi, and are like people trying in vain to blow out sunlight and to cut water with a sword, while you are like boiling water that melts solid ice. Though they rely on their supernatural powers, they are but externals, and will only succeed in destroying you if you, who own the five aggregates in your minds, are deluded, and let them do so. For these demons cannot harm you in your state of dhyana if you are awakened and are not deluded. If you wipe out the five aggregates, you will enter the state of brightness, wherein all demons are but dark vapors. Since light destroys darkness, they will perish as soon as they approach you. How then dare they disturb the state of samadhi? On the other hand, if you fail to awaken and are thereby deluded by the five aggregates, then, Ananda, you will become a son of Mara, and help the demons. As an illustration, Matangi, who was so base, used magic to cause you to break one of the 80,000 minor rules of pure living. But since your mind was pure, you were not ruined. This shows the imminent loss of all your precious Bodhi. You were almost like a chancellor of state whose possessions are suddenly confiscated, so that he is in straitened circumstances without any hope of obtaining aid. The ten states affected by the first aggregate of form, or rupa. Ananda, when you sit in meditation, if your thoughts are wiped out, the state of your mind, now free from them, will be clear and will not be changed by either stillness or disturbance. In this state, both remembrance and forgetfulness are one undivided whole. While in it, and before realizing samadhi, you are like a man whose eyes are clear, but who is still in the dark. For though your mind is clear, it does not yet shine. This is the aggregate of form that conditions your meditation. If your mind radiates, you will clearly perceive all the ten directions of space. This disappearance of darkness is called the ending of rupa, and you will then leap over and beyond the turbid kalpa the main cause of which is your wrong thinking. 1. Ananda, in this profound and clear state of your penetrating mind, the four elements cease to hinder you, and after a little your body will be free from all hindrance. This is your clear mind spreading to its objects and shows the effectiveness of your meditation, the temporary achievement of which does not mean that you are a saint, if you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will succumb to demons. 2. Ananda, in this profound and clear state of your penetrating mind, you will be able to discern everything clearly in your body and will suddenly see lively tapeworms. This is your clear mind spreading in your body and shows its effective functioning, the temporary achievement of which does not mean that you are a saint. If you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will succumb to demons. 3. Further, in this state of mind, which penetrates both within and without, your spirit and faculties, though not your body, will intermingle as principles or hosts, and accessories or guests. And suddenly you will hear a voice in the air preaching the Dharma or proclaiming its secret meaning in the ten directions. This is your spirit and faculties which unite with or disengage from one another to sow the excellent seed, the temporary realization of which does not mean that you are a saint. If you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. 
but if you do, you will succumb to demons. 4. Further, in this clear, revealing, bright and penetrating state of mind, your inner light radiates and gilds everything in the ten directions, wherein all living beings are transformed into Buddhas. Suddenly you will see Varochana, seated on a radiant throne, surrounded by thousands of Buddhas, with hundreds of lakhs of countries and of lotus flowers, all of which appear at once. This is the effect of being awakened by your mind's spirituality, the light of which penetrates and shines on all the worlds. This temporary achievement does not mean you are a saint. If you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will succumb to demons. 5. Further, if your penetrating mind, in its profound and clear state, continues to look within without pause, and so checks and stops completely all thinking, you will suddenly see space in the ten directions change into the colors of the seven or of a hundred precious gems, which fill the whole space without hindering one another. All colors, such as blue, yellow, red, white, etc., appear in utter purity. This is hard-pressed efficiency, the temporary achievement of which does not mean you are a saint. If you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will give way to the demons. 6. In this clear and penetrating state of your mind, when it looks within, its light appears in all its purity, and at midnight you will suddenly see in your dark room all sorts of apparitions, as clearly as in broad daylight, with all the other objects usually there. This is the mind in its subtlety, refining its clear perception, which enables you to see distinctly in the dark. This temporary achievement does not mean you are a saint. If you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will give way to demons. 7. As the mind merges with the void, suddenly your four limbs will be like grass and plants, and will feel nothing even if burned by fire or cut by a knife. This immunity from injury results from the amalgamation of mind and externals, and with the elimination of the four elements as it merges with the void. This temporary achievement does not mean you are a saint, and if you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will give way to demons. 8. As your mind becomes pure and clean, its uttermost purification causes you to see suddenly the great earth, mountains, and rivers in the ten directions change into the Buddha's pure land, adorned with all sorts of precious gems, whose radiance is all-pervading. You will again see clearly Buddhas as countless as the Ganges sands, with beautiful temple buildings filling the whole of space, with the hells underneath and deva palaces above. This is the transformation of usually deep-rooted thoughts of like and dislike, but does not mean you are a saint. If you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will give way to demons. 9. As your mind penetrates deeper, you will suddenly see, at midnight, far away, marketplaces, streets, and lanes, as well as members of your family, your relatives and clansmen, or hear them speak. This results from the hard-pressed mind which expands so that you see these things no matter how far away. This does not mean you are a saint. And if you do not regard it as such, it is an excellent progressive stage. But if you do, you will give way to demons. 10. As a result of your mind's furthest penetration, you will see men of good counsel, whose bodies change without reason in all kinds of ways. This is your perverse mind, which is influenced by mischievous ghosts or heavenly demons, and which without reason preaches the Dharma and comprehends its profound meaning. This does not mean you are a saint, and if you do not regard it as such, Mara's influence will vanish. But if you do, you will give way to demons. Ananda, these ten states of Dhyana 
come from the intermingling of the aggregate of form with the meditative mind. Deluded and wayward practicers do not know their own capabilities, cannot distinguish these states when they manifest, and wrongly declare that they are saints. By so doing, they break the prohibition against lying, and so fall into the uninterrupted hell. After my nirvana, in the dharma-ending age, you should proclaim this teaching, so that the heavenly demons cannot take advantage of such states, and practicers can be on their guard and realize the supreme Tao. The ten states affected by the second aggregate of receptiveness, or Vedana. Ananda, in the practice of Shamatha, to realize Samadhi, when the first aggregate of form ceases to hinder, one will see the minds of all Buddhas, like reflections in the bright mirror of the mind. One will feel as if one wins something, but cannot yet make use of it. It is like a sleeper troubled with a nightmare, who cannot move to repulse it, although his four limbs are not bound and his consciousness is clear. This is the second aggregate of receptiveness, which conditions one's meditation. If the nightmare vanishes, one's mind can leave one's body to look at one's face and will be free to stay or go without further hindrance. This is the second aggregate of Vedana, coming to an end, and the practicer will then be able to leap over and beyond the kalpa of turbid views, the main cause of which is the seeming perspicacity of his wrong thinking. 1. Ananda when the practicer reaches this stage, he will find himself in a great mass of brightness. His mind will discern the sorry plight of living beings, and on being pressed harder, it will give rise to infinite sadness. He will even regard gadflies and mosquitoes as his own children, on whom he takes pity, bursting unconsciously into tears. This results from his hard-pressed contemplation, and is harmless if he knows its cause. It is not the saintly state, and if he understands it, it will in time disappear. However, if he regards it as sainthood, he will succumb to the demon of sadness, who will control his mind and cause him to be miserable and to lament when meeting others. He will lose the benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will fall into the lower states. 2. Ananda in this state of dhyana, as the aggregate of form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, he makes more progress and may, because of overstrain, develop infinite boldness that sharpens his resolve and makes it equal to that of all Buddhas, so that he can leap over the three great eons in a moment of thought. This comes from overstrained concentration which will be harmless if he knows it for what it is. It is not sainthood and if it is well understood, it will in time vanish. But if he regards it as saintly, the demon of wildness will control his mind and will cause him to boast of his achievement when he meets others. He will become proud and self-important, which will blind him to the Buddha high above and to living beings here below. He will thus lose the benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will fall into the lower states. 3. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, if the practicer makes no headway but loses sight of his previous state when looking back, the power of his mind weakens. As it sees nothing ahead, it suddenly gives way to dryness, which causes him to indulge in endless, deep reflection, which he may mistake for progressive advance. This is absent-mindedness, which lacks wisdom, and is harmless if he knows it for what it is. This is not sainthood, but if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of unforgetfulness, who will control his mind and confine it to a fixed place, causing him to lose the benefit from the dhyana so far achieved, and to fall into the lower states. 4. In this still state, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, the practicer's wisdom may grow out of proportion and much in excess of his dhyana, and he may wrongly think that he has achieved the highest attainment and has reached the rank of Virochna. 
so he is satisfied with a little progress which he regards as complete. This is his mind losing its usual insight and being misled by his discriminatory knowing and seeing. If he understands this, it will be harmless. But if he regards it as sainthood, he will succumb to the inferior self-satisfied demon who will control his mind, causing him to boast that he has realized supreme nirvana. He will thus lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will fall into the lower states. 5. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, before new headway is made and after his previous experience has passed, he may find himself in a situation which seems very dreadful and full of danger and causes him endless anxiety and perplexity. He seems to sit on a hot iron bed or to drink poisonous medicine. As a result, he tires of life and seeks to end it to get rid of this torment. This is practice without the necessary expedient method and is harmless if he knows the cause. It is not a saintly state, but if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of anxiety who will control his mind, causing him to cut his own flesh with a sharp knife so that he can die or to flee to the mountains and groves in order to avoid other people. He will thus lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will fall into the lower states. 6. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, the practicer may, after feeling very comfortable in the condition of purity and cleanness, suddenly experience infinite joy, which becomes so intense that he cannot check it. This is delight in weightlessness, which is uncontrollable for lack of wisdom and is harmless if he knows the cause. This is not a saintly state, but if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of joy, who will control his mind so that he laughs without cause when seeing others and sings and dances in the street, boasting of his realization of unhindered liberation. He will lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will fall into the lower states. 7. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, the practicer may think that he has achieved full realization. This illusion causes him suddenly, without any reason, to give rise to self-conceit, so that he regards himself, though inferior, as equal to others, though equal as superior to others and to superiors, as being a saint when he is not, and as not inferior to inferiors. All these feelings occur together. Even all the Buddhas are nothing to him, still more so the less advanced Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas. This is an extraordinary state from which he fails to extricate himself for lack of wisdom. It will be harmless if he knows that it is not a saintly state, but if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of self-conceit, who will control his mind and cause him to stop revering the stupas and temples and to destroy the sutras and statues of Buddhas. He will declare to his patrons, Statues are but gold, bronze, clay and wood, and sutras are but palm or putra leaves and clothes. Instead of revering the body of flesh and blood, which is really permanent, it is sheer nonsense to worship clay and wood. Those who believe him destroy the statues and sutras and throw them on the ground. They are misled by him and so will enter the unintermittent hell. Thus he will lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will fall into the lower states. 8. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, the practicer may achieve the condition of bright purity and awaken to the profound noumenon to which he conforms, thereby suddenly experiencing infinite weightlessness. He will think that he is a saint, which gives him comfortable independence. This is weightless purity, which is harmless if he knows that it is not a saintly state. But if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of weightless purity, who will control his mind, causing him to be well satisfied with his incomplete achievement and to refrain from striving to advance further. 
He is like the untutored, bhikshu who misled others and then fell into the Avicii hell. He will thus lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved and will sink into the lower states. 9. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, the practicer may misconceive the appearing bright emptiness as devoid of nature thereby giving rise to the idea of extinction, which implies that the law of causality is invalid. This relative voidness causes him to develop an empty mind, which implies annihilation. This is harmless if he knows that it is not sainthood. But if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of emptiness, who will control his mind and cause him to criticize those observing the rules of pure living as men of Hinayana and to claim that all bodhisattvas awakened to the void can dispense with all prohibitions. Such a person usually indulges in meat and wine in the presence of his believing patrons and leads a licentious life. Because of the demon's influence, he controls them firmly, and they do not suspect him. As time passes, they will all regard excrement, urine, meat, and wine as empty and good for food. They will break the rules of morality and discipline, and will commit all sorts of sins. The practicer will thus lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved, and will fall into the lower states. 10. In this state of dhyana, as form vanishes and receptiveness manifests, the practicer may cling to the empty brightness, which will then penetrate his mind and even his bones. Suddenly, he will feel strong love for it, which drives him mad and develops his intense desire of it. This is a condition of still comfort, which he cannot control for lack of wisdom, and which misleads him into all sorts of desires. It is harmless if he knows that it is not sainthood, but if he regards it as such, he will succumb to the demon of desire, who will control his mind and cause him to proclaim desire as the Bodhi path, and to teach to laymen the practice of universal desire, saying that sexual indulgence will make them sons of the Dharma. This demon's influence will prevail in the Dharma ending age, and will affect stupid people, who will number as many as hundreds, thousands, and tens of thousands. When the demon is weary of the practicer's misdeeds, he will leave the latter's body, which will become a sorry wreck, to suffer all the miseries inflicted by the royal law. For deceiving others, he will fall into the unintermittent hell. Thus, he will lose all benefit from the dhyana so far achieved, and will sink into the lower states. Ananda, these ten states of dhyana come from the intermingling of the second aggregate of receptiveness with meditative mind. Deluded and wayward practicers do not know their own capabilities, cannot distinguish these states when they manifest, and wrongly declare that they have attained the holy rank. By so doing, they break the rule against lying, and so will fall into the uninterrupted hell. After my nirvana, in the Dharma ending age, you should proclaim this teaching so that living beings will awaken to it, that the heavenly demon cannot take advantage of such states, and that practicers can be on their guard and realize the supreme Tao. The ten states affected by the third aggregate of conception, or Sangya. Ananda, in the cultivation of Samadhi, when the second aggregate of receptiveness ceases to hinder the practicer, Although he is still in the worldly stream, his mind can now escape from his body like a bird from its cage. From his worldly state, he can now achieve the sixty succeeding holy stages of bodhisattva development into Buddhahood, and thereby take any form at will, free to move anywhere without hindrance. This is like a man who talks in his sleep, and though he does not know what he says, his words are in order and comprehensible and those who are not asleep understand him. This is the third aggregate of conception, which conditions his meditation. If all his stirring thoughts stop, he will be rid of the thinking process, and his clear mind will be like a mirror rubbed clean of the covering dust, and will throw light upon his present incarnation from birth to death. Then, 
the third aggregate of conception ceases to function, and the practicer will be able to leap above and beyond the kalpa of turbid passions, the main cause of which was the seeming pervasiveness of his wrong thinking. 1. Ananda, now that the practicer is free from anxiety, after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in the state of perfect dhyana and likes its pure brightness. But he may be tempted to concentrate on the one thought of skillfully advancing, thus submitting to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the dharma of the sutras and think that he too has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat reserved for reputable monks to teach him the dharma. To show his skill, he will appear either as a monk, Indra, a woman or a nun, and his body will send out rays of light that illumine the dark bedroom. The practicer will mistake him for a bodhisattva and will believe what he says. As a result, his mind will waver and he will break the rules and have desires. The man will speak of weal and woe, of a Buddha appearing at a certain place, of scorching fire in the Kalpa of destruction, and of future fighting and wars to frighten and ruin other people. This is the strange ghost who has become a demon in his old age and who now comes to trouble the practicer. When he is weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher the possessed, man and pupil the practicer will suffer all the miseries inflicted by the royal law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hell. 2. Ananda now that the practicer is free from false anxiety after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in the state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted to roam about in unknown regions, and so concentrates on the one thought of gaining further experience, thus succumbing to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the dharma and think that he himself has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to teach him the dharma. Without changing his own appearance, he will cause the practicer and those present to see their own radiant golden bodies seated on precious lotus flowers. The practicer will be deceived into mistaking the man for a bodhisattva and will believe what he says. As a result, he will indulge in luxurious ease, breaking the Buddha's rules and becoming licentious. The man will speak of Buddha's appearing in the world of a certain person at a given place, who is a Buddha in his transformation body and of someone else who is a bodhisattva coming to convert people. The practicer is fascinated and admires what he has seen thereby giving rise to wrong views and so destroying his seed of wisdom. This is the drought ghost who has become a demon in his old age and now comes to trouble the practicer. When he is weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hell. 3. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted by his delight to concentrate on the one thought of uniting with it, thus succumbing to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the Dharma and think that he himself has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to teach him the Dharma. Without changing his own 
or the listener's forms. He will cause them to open their minds, which will jump about so that, in turn, they know all their former lives. Read the minds of others. See the hells. Comprehend all good and evil worldly deeds. Read gathas and recite sutras. And so he fascinates them with such rare things. The practicer will be deceived into mistaking him for a true bodhisattva and will be enthusiastic about all he says thereby breaking the Buddha's rules and becoming licentious. This man will classify the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas into big and small, early and late, real and false, and male and female. The practicer believes him so that his mind is disturbed and he becomes a heretic. This is the beast ghost who has become a demon in his old age and who now comes to trouble the practicer. When he is weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hell. 4. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana, but he may be tempted by his delight in it to go to the root of all things in order to know the beginning and the end of all transformation, thereby wishing to analyze everything, to solve all his doubts to his entire satisfaction. As a result, the heavenly demon immediately possesses another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the Dharma, thinking that he himself has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place where he will take the high seat to teach him the Dharma, showing his awe-inspiring authority to which the meditator willingly submits even before hearing his words. He will declare that the Buddha's nirvanic and bodhic dharmakaya is his own body of flesh and blood, which inherits the holy essence as a son from his father, that it is the permanent spiritual body which will be transmitted forever, that what his listeners see around them is the Buddha land, and that there is no other pure region nor another golden body. The practicer will believe this, lose his former still mind and submit to him, praising the rare revelation. He and other deluded listeners will mistake the possessed man for a true bodhisattva and will follow him to break the Buddha's rules by indulging in sexual desire. This man will declare that the eyes, ears, nose, and tongue are pure lands, and that the male and female organs are the abodes of Bodhi and Nirvana, and his deluded listeners will believe his perverse preaching. This is the noxious or nightmarish ghost, who has become a demon in his old age, and now comes to trouble the practicer. When he grows weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should be first clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. 5. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety, after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect iana. But he may be tempted by his delight in it to see communion with the Buddha, and thereby feels a strong desire for spiritual intercourse, thus succumbing to the heavenly demon who will immediately possess another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will as directed, preach the Dharma and think that he has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to teach the Dharma and cause his listeners to see him as a man a hundred or a thousand years old. They will admire him, will live with and serve him, and provide him with the four necessities of a monk, and will not tire of so doing since the practicer is convinced that the man was his master in a previous life he respects and becomes attached to him praising his rare revelation 
He and other deluded listeners will mistake him for a true bodhisattva and will follow his instruction, thereby breaking the Buddha's rules and indulging in sexual desire. The man will declare that in a previous life he delivered his wife or brother who now comes to follow him to a particular region where they will all serve a certain Buddha. Or he will speak of a radiant heaven where the Buddha now dwells and where all the Tathagatas are at rest. The practicer, who is deluded, will believe all this and will lose his clear mind. This is the cruel ghost, who has become a demon in his old age and now comes to trouble the practicer. When he grows weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. 6. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted by his delight in it to strive to go deeper in his search for restfulness and so succumb to the heavenly demon who will possess another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the Dharma, and also think that he has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to teach the Dharma and cause each of his listeners to know his own karma. He will tell one of them that, though the latter is still living, he is already an animal, or order another to sit on the ground and then make him unable to get up. Those present will admire his supernatural powers and submit themselves to him. If one of them thinks of anything, the man knows it at once. He will order them to practice unnecessary austerities in addition to the Buddhist precepts. He will vilify the bhikshus and curse their followers. He will reveal others' shortcomings without being afraid of ridicule. He will foretell weal and woe which later materialize. This is the powerful ghost who has become a demon in his old age and who now comes to trouble the practicer. When he is weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. 7. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted by his delight in it to strive for more learning in his search for knowledge of his former lives thereby succumbing to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to harm the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the Dharma and also think that he himself has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to teach the Dharma, and the latter suddenly finds a precious pearl in the room. The demon will either appear as an animal with, in his mouth, a pearl and other precious stones, documents, and registers which it gives to the man to deceive his listeners, or will hide a bright pearl in the ground to light up the whole place. His listeners will praise the miracle. The possessed man will abstain from food, eating only medicinal herbs, or will take only a hemp seed or a grain of wheat each day. But the demon will cause him to be strong and sturdy, he will vilify the bhikshus and curse their followers. He will reveal other people's shortcomings without being afraid of ridicule. He will reveal secret places where treasures are hidden and where saints live, and those who then go there actually meet strange persons. This is the ghost of the mountains, groves, and rivers who has become a demon in his old age. His aim is to encourage others to break the Buddha's rules, to indulge in lust and give rein to the five desires arising from the objects of the five senses. If he makes progress at the start of his practice, he will eat only herbs and plants and his actions will be uncertain. 
His object is to trouble the practicer, and when he is weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. 8. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety, after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted by his delight in it to seek and use the above supernatural powers, thus succumbing to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to trouble him. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the Dharma, and also think that he has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to preach the Dharma. He will hold a ball of fire, which he divides into as many balls as there are listeners putting one on each of their heads. They will not feel the heat and will not be burned, although the fireballs are several feet high. He also walks on water, sits motionless in the air, enters a bottle or a bag and walks through the wall but he is not immune to choppers and swords. He claims to be a Buddha, and though he is a layman, he dares to receive reverence from the bhikshus, cursing their disciples and vilifying the rules of discipline. He likes to disclose other people's shortcomings without being afraid of ridicule. He boasts of his supernatural powers and causes his listeners to see Buddha lands, which are false and unreal. He praises carnality and encourages licentious conduct, which he uses to transmit his dharma. This is one of those strong spirits of the mountains, seas, wind, rivers, and earth, dwelling in grass and plants, or a naga, or decaying seer, about to die and become a ghost, whose forms are possessed by other ghosts, one of which now comes to trouble the practicer. When he grows weary of his misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. 9. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety, after his receptiveness has vanished, he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted by his delight in it to seek the extinction of suffering in nirvana, and so searches deeply into the nature of transformation in his search for profound emptiness. As a result, he succumbs to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to trouble the meditator. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the dharma, and also think that he has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to preach the Dharma to his listeners. In their presence, he will disappear suddenly and then descend from the sky, again vanishing and reappearing at will. His body will seem transparent as crystal and his limbs will be fragrant like sandalwood. His excrement and urine are as hard as rock candy. He breaks the Buddha's rules and despises all monks and nuns. He preaches that the law of causality is invalid, that there is annihilation after death, and no such thing as reincarnation or worldly and saintly states after this life. Though he has realized voidness, he indulges in sexual desires and boasts that his followers also realize the void in which there is neither cause nor effect. This is one of those ghosts and spirits who live for thousands and tens of thousands of years and have become demons in their old age. He now comes to trouble the practicer, and when he grows weary of these misdeeds, he will leave the possessed man. Then both teacher and pupil will suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. 10. Now that the practicer is free from false anxiety after his receptiveness has vanished, 
he finds himself in this state of perfect dhyana. But he may be tempted by his delight in it to seek longevity and indulge in tiresome research in his quest for eternity by relinquishing his mortal lot in exchange for immortality. Thus he succumbs to the heavenly demon who immediately possesses another man to trouble him. This man, unaware that he is possessed, will, as directed, preach the Dharma and also think that he himself has realized supreme nirvana. He will then come to the practicer's place and take the high seat to teach the Dharma to those present, declaring that he can travel to and from distant places at will, will then go thousands of miles away and return to his seat in the twinkling of an eye, bringing things back with him. Or he may show them that for years they will be unable to walk more than a few paces across the room. They will believe him and mistake him for a Buddha. He will then proclaim that all living beings are his children, that he is a begetter of Buddhas, that he appears in the world to save others, that he is the primal Buddha and needs no practice to be so. This heavenly demon may be either a jealous female spirit or Chamunda from the Ishwara heaven or a consumer of vitality or Pishacha from the heaven of the four Deva kings who has not a straightforward mind and uses the practicer's wrong thinking to absorb his vitality. He may not possess another man, but may appear as one with power to wield a vajra to bestow long life on the practicer or as a beautiful girl to seduce him, thereby exhausting his vitality. He is delirious and can be distinguished by his incoherent speech. But if the practicer fails to recognize him, he will make mischief. The meditator will then suffer the miseries inflicted by the law. He usually dies from exhaustion before his punishment is carried out by the authorities. You should first be clear about this temptation to avoid returning to sansara. But if you are deluded and do not recognize it, you will fall into the unintermittent hells. You should know that in the time of the Dharma's ending, Ananda, these ten kinds of demons will join communities of monastics who practice in accord with my Dharma. These demons may possess people or may appear in a body that they have created for themselves. But in either case, they will make the claim that they have already attained the right and universal awakening of a Buddha. They will praise sexual desire and will violate the Buddha's regulations. These evil and demonic teachers that I have just described will transmit their teachings to their followers by engaging in sexual acts with them. In these ways, depraved demons will take control of practitioners' minds. And for the practitioner's next nine lives, or for as many as a hundred lives, the practitioners will join the retinues of demons, although they may have wished to be true to their former practices. At the end of those lives, they will inevitably become demons themselves, having failed to realize their claim to right and universal awakening. They will fall into the unrelenting hell. Ananda, there is no need for you to attain nirvana now. Though you have reached the stage beyond all studies, you should fulfill your vow to re-enter this world in the Dharma ending age to develop great compassion and to deliver those living beings whose minds are set on right belief so that they will not be troubled by demons but realize right knowledge. I have delivered you from sansara, and by carrying out my order you will repay your debt of gratitude to the Buddha. Ananda, the above ten states of dhyana come from the intermingling of the third aggregate of conception with meditative mind. Deluded and wayward practicers who do not know their capabilities cannot distinguish these states when they manifest and wrongly declare that they have attained the holy rank. By so doing, they break the prohibition against lying and will fall into the unintermittent hells. After my nirvana in the Dharma ending age, you should proclaim this teaching so that living beings will awaken to it, that heavenly demons cannot take advantage of such states, and that all practicers can be on their guard and realize the supreme Tao.